We begin with new revelations from a special grand jury's investigation into election interference by Donald Trump and his allies in Georgia. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis launched this criminal inquiry two years ago. The grand jury heard from 75 witnesses, combed through mountains of data for eight months. Today, three sections of the panel's final report were made public. One of the key findings was that perjury may have been committed by one or more of the witnesses. The report recommended the DA seek indictments for such crimes, but no witness names were released. Several key Trump allies were subpoenaed, including Senator Lindsey Graham. Earlier today, he stood by his testimony. Yes, I'm very confident. I have no idea uh, what they're going to do. I'll just leave that. So you're confident you're not one of the ones who perjured themselves? The grand jury's report also showed it, quote, found no widespread fraud took place in the Georgia 2020 election. Trump's infamous phone call to Georgia election officials was at the center of this investigation. And those baseless claims were also part of the January 6th committee's inquiry. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. Mr. Secretary, was the president here asking you for exactly what he wanted, one more vote than his opponent? What I knew is that we didn't have any votes to find. We had to continue to look. Uh, we investigated, like I just shared the numbers with you. There were no votes to find. That was an accurate count that had been certified. Also tonight, new developments in the defamation case filed against Fox News by Dominion Voting Systems. The New York Times reports that a new legal filing from Dominion shows, quote, newly disclosed messages and testimony from some of the biggest stars and most senior executives at Fox News revealed that they privately expressed disbelief about President Donald J. Trump's false claims that the 2020 election was stolen from him, even though the network continued to promote many of those lies on the air. Dominion is suing Fox News for $1.6 billion. With important news from that Georgia grand jury report today, our next guest says we cannot forget how close we came to a coup. Philip Bump of The Washington Post points out that with an eye on 2024, Donald Trump is again trying to whitewash January 6th. With us for more, historian John Meacham. He is the Rogers Chair in the American Presidency at Vanderbilt University. Occasionally advises President Biden on historical matters and major speeches. He is also the author of End There Was Light, Abraham Lincoln, and the American Struggle, which is out now. John Meacham in the flesh. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for staying up late Thank for you. me. So I, I know you are worried yeah. about this. How worried are you? The issue is going to be, does an attempted coup against the Constitution become just another talking point? Just another thing. Well, the fake news, they're trying to tell you this is important. It's not. Uh, they're martyrs. You know, they were just really angry people. And I think one of the things we have to watch is as Trump continues to run again, uh, you have NBC polling, I think that sort of NBC's reporting polling, but he's stronger than the chattering class has wanted him to be. We just have to be incredibly vigilant to understand that Mike Pence stood between us and the abyss. And now, if you do what I do for a living, you always want people to think about the past, but this isn't all that far back. And I just hope that we don't turn the page so quickly. We don't click on the next screen so quickly that we forget how an appetite for power of a single person, a single party, really did almost end a democratic lowercase d conversation. The question I always circle back to is, won't it take Republicans, potentially in this case, Republicans who are running for that office to articulate that truth? Yeah. And it brings me to my secondary question, which is, I actually don't think there are a lot of moments in history where one can demonstrate a profile in courage. And this yes. seems like such a, a ripe moment for that, right? Where it's like, yeah. maybe you won't get reelected. Maybe you'll, right. you know, get a lot of hell on Twitter for six months. Doesn't that seem worth history remembering you as one of the greats? I certainly think so. I think Liz Cheney has done that. Uh, but she is now former yeah. representative. And a politician's unit of commerce, by and large, is reelection. 
Michael Bloomberg once said, the, th the, th the three things politicians most want is re-election, number two is re-election, and three is a l big re-election, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that's where we are. I think the only way, the only amendment I'd make to what you said is there needs to be people speaking out against this in the Republican field. I fear that the only way to make this point is to defeat Republicans who won't. And I never thought I'd be in a position of saying voting for one party or the other is crucial to the survival of the constitutional order. But I continue to believe in this moment that voting for the Democratic Party is a vote for democracy, lowercase d. The Democratic Party could lose its mind at some point. But as of tonight, it hasn't. The arguments that people have with the Democrats are recognizable American arguments about the relative role of the state in the marketplace, about the projection of force against commonly agreed upon foes and rivals. That's all a recognizable conversation and covenant. What Trump Republicans are doing is not recognizable. Even during the Civil War, people didn't storm the Capitol in this way. And you really can't, over, as to paraphrase George W. Bush, you can't misoverestimate <laughs> the significance of this, right? Mitt Romney warned yesterday Trump is by far the most likely Republican nominee. I know you've seen that polling. Do you, do you think that's right? Yeah, I do. Uh, I live in Tennessee, so when I say I have conservative friends, that's redundant. Um, I think so. I think people convince themselves of what they want to do anyway, right? And one of the things that has puzzled me about the last year and a half and continues to, but keep working on it. You mentioned I, I help President Biden when, when I can, is trying to, ar trying to argue that President Biden is somehow outside the mainstream of American politics is just crazy. And I understand why people say it, because they want a Republican order, but they have not managed to separate a Republican agenda from Donald Trump. And you just can't have it both ways. This is not a moment where you can. And to your point, Lord, wouldn't you want to be in X number of years, Liz Cheney, to go back to the McCarthy era, do you want to be McCarthy or do you want to be Margaret Chase Smith, who stood up against him four years before he was censured? Right, because you can want re-election, re-election, a big re-election that's fundamentally a proxy for power, but then you actually have to want that power to do something with it, not power for the sake of power. That's the moral question about politics. And I, I'm not asking for people to be virtuous. I'm just asking for people to have an essential moral core which, as Lincoln would say, is a devotion to the Declaration of Independence. I may be asking people to be virtuous. I, I, I saw another story today that I want to talk to you about, which was... I will have more success <laughs> <laughs> yes. by not no. asking people. Agreed, agreed. Okay. Um, you saw the news about John Fetterman, you know, yeah. checking himself in, needing to head out. I thought this was so interesting, and for you to talk to you about it as a presidential historian, because... There have been a number of leaders throughout time. I think about Lincoln mm. and the mental health struggles Lincoln went through that, that fundamentally made him who he was as a leader. And so the idea of a leader saying this publicly, disclosing this publicly, I think it is a great service. And I think it even has the capacity to be a paradigm shift. Amen. 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 Absolutely. Um, Winston Churchill suffered uh pretty clearly from depression. He treated it by painting and with Johnny Walker, uh, which is not prescribed mm -hmm. mostly anymore. But it's, you know, there's a kind of genius that uh, a, a kind of political being that goes to great up, great highs and great lows. And I don't know uh, Senator Fetterman, but I wish him all the best. There's nothing more de debilitating uh, than what William Styron called darkness visible. And so I think we should uh, hope for his recovery. And I think, I hope you're exactly right that there's a destigmatization. John Meacham, thank you so much for being with me. This thank you. Such a treat. Since my very first moments in the job, I have believed that part of serving well would be to know almost instinctively when the time is right to make way for someone else. And when that time came, to have the courage to do so, even if to many across the country and in my party, it might feel too soon. 
In my head and in my heart, I know that time is now. The last thing before we go tonight, the privilege of power. Scotland's leader, Nicola Sturgeon, made the surprising announcement on Wednesday that she'll be stepping down from her position, citing the toll of the job. The 52-year-old leader made history in 2014 when she became Scotland's first female first minister. She's dedicated her life to the cause of Scottish independence, but recently concluded that she may be too polarizing of a figure to get the job done. Surgeon's resignation comes just weeks after Jacinda Ardern decided to step down as New Zealand's prime minister, saying she no longer had enough in the tank. Now, it's worth noting that these are two leaders are choosing to leave office when there are others who lead countries who refuse to go, even denying election losses. It makes you wonder, what if power were treated as a privilege worthy of stewardship, not something to hoard, something to cling to? Here's more of Sturgeon on her decision to step down. I'm not expecting violins here, but I am a human being as well as a politician. Giving absolutely everything of yourself to this job is the only way to do it. The country deserves nothing less. But in truth, that can only be done by anyone for so long. For me, it is now in danger of becoming too long. No violins, just a cheer for strong leadership. Nicholas Sturgeon to take us off the air tonight.